Hello everyone. <clears throat> Welcome back to the second uh, lecture in our series on FNMI education. Uh, the first lecture concerned, well, a bunch of really important uh, terms, terminology, that I wanted you to know that you need to really know and to think about where it came from, what it means, who uses it, when you can use it, uh, who isn't entitled to use it. Um, today's lecture uh, is an extension of that. Today's lecture, we're actually going to begin to look at, um, well, a couple things really. We're doing, um, we're ex I'm, I'm wanting to expose you to this spectrum of uh, Aboriginal policy um, along those lines that I showed you. Uh, in the last lecture and at the beginning of this presentation, you know, where you have on the one side assimilationist policies, that's on the one extreme, and then on the other extreme we have what's called parallelism. And parallelism is pretty much the opposite. That's where instead of trying to make everybody the same, we deny any similarities whatsoever and we talk about absolute separation. Neither extreme is, is healthy. In a, in a democracy like Canada, uh, neither is is um, very workable. Um, both have very negative consequences. Uh, and the happy medium is uh, the most virtuous position, I would say. You know, Aristotle says virtue is a mean. I would say it's it's the best policy in the middle somewhere. Uh, we're going to go through today and talk about the spectrum, what it means, how to interpret things along the spectrum and then I also want to expose you to um, to the treaties. Okay, so let's begin with exposing uh, or you know beginning to think about what is the spectrum? <clears throat> what is Aboriginal policy? Well, when the government has an official position on how Aboriginal people should relate with the state, this is called Aboriginal policy. Aboriginal policy is the set of laws that organize the relationship between Aboriginal people and the government. Good Aboriginal policy must 1. address the particular needs and concerns of Native Canadians, 2. avoid the extremes of both assimilation on the one hand and separatism on the other hand, or parallelism on the other hand, right? And it should keep Aboriginal people in the Canadian state. 3. <clears throat> not, overlook the, not overlook the importance of Canadian citizenship for Aboriginal people. Uh, again, one of my favorite political scientists, if any of you are um, students of political science and Canadian political science um, in particular, pretty much anyone who's gone through a program anywhere will be familiar with Alan Cairns. He is uh, one of the granddaddies of uh, political science and Canadian politics. And um, this is a quote from him, you know, he asks us, Is the goal a single society with one basic model of belonging? Or is the goal a kind of parallelism, a side-by-side -side coexistence, or some intermediate position? So, there I've drawn for you um, I've sketched for you a line, that red line down there. On the one side we have assimilationism, and on the other side we have parallelism. These two extremes, uh, both positions are uh, destructive. Um, in the middle, somewhere along the middle, either closer to assimilationism or closer to parallelism or somewhere dead center maybe, that's that's uh, where the best policy would lie, it seems to. Uh, Karen seems to suggest, and I think I agree with him. But, you know, you can make up your own mind. And here is that, <clears throat> that table that I showed you. Uh, we begin. You can, you can revisit this table. Uh, think about it. I've, I've decided to uh, place uh, some of the more significant uh, Aboriginal policies along the um, spectrum where I thought they belonged. Uh, you know, maybe you see it differently, but... Or, uh, out of my studies, this is kind of how it's it's uh, you know things have panned out as far as I can see. Okay, so <clears throat> Canada's history of cultural genocide with Native peoples: how education was central to the harm we did. 
use the term genocide. It's a very uh, loaded term. Many people take offense when you use the word genocide for anything, uh, but specific things like the um, Holocaust the, the, in uh, World War II um, or the Rwandan genocide. Um, but um, I think equally as many people are, are uh, comfortable with using the word cultural genocide to describe what happened to <clears throat> Native Canadians, you know, uh, they weren't, uh, you know, Native people weren't rounded up and put in gas chambers like in World War II, but uh, their culture was stripped from them, their language, their traditions, their language, you know, a a a all, all the, uh, their whole entire identity was, this is a process of obliteration, right? And in fact, many did die. Um, there's evidence now from the Reconciliation Commission, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that at least 4,000 Aboriginal students died in Canadian residential schools from things like fire, uh, abuse, uh, sickness, disease, these sorts of things. <clears throat> well, let's begin with this question. What was the historical attitude of the federal government towards Aboriginal Canadians? The federal government had a melting pot philosophy towards Aboriginal peoples until the late 1960s, which aimed at common Canadianism. It's interesting, too, because when you or I think about melting pots, I mean, when I was a kid in high school, we were taught the melting pot strategy is something that the American uh, the Americans always use to uh, bring immigrants into the country uh, and turn them into American citizens. Whereas my teacher back then used to say, Canada is not a melting pot; it's more of a salad bowl, <laughs> meaning that uh, you know, with our official multicultural uh, multiculturalism, it was meant that you didn't have to melt, you didn't have to everybody smush and become Americans or become. Canadians in, in the same way. It wasn't about assimilation, it was more about, you know, letting the differences remain, right? So you're an onion, you're an onion, you're a tomato, you're a tomato, or a cucumber, whatever, right? You get my point. Uh, but it doesn't work that way for Native people, obviously, right? It was very much about assimilating them, absorbing them, destroying their uh, Indianness as it is, uh, or their Aboriginality, and um, taking that away, and and turning them into basically white people. <clears throat> so the idea was to contain and separate Aboriginal Canadians on reservations apart from the rest of the society, society in order to civilize them so that at some future date Native people would be mature and responsible enough to be full Canadian citizens. Aboriginal Canadians were treated like children or wards of the state. For this reason until 1960 Native people were not even allowed to vote. So, I mean, if you were going to vote prior to that, uh, the only way you could do it is by losing your Indian status, right? Uh, no longer being an Indian, uh, but, um, you know, um, t basically getting your in Indian status taken away and then you, you, could, uh, you could vote. Native bands throughout the province <clears throat> that have signed treaties with the government are legally termed Indians, since the first European explorers of the New World thought that they had found a new route to India. We discussed that last lecture. Uh, the federal government has historically treated Indians as children's or, children or wards of the state. Indian is still the legal term used, term used in reference to this category of Native, native Canadians. The government's uh, relation with Indians is governed by nine, Section 9124 of the BNA Act and by the Indian Act. In law, all Indian peoples are entitled to live on Indian land, called reservations, free from taxation. So again, if any of the words or terms that I'm using right now are confusing for you, uh, just go back and review the, um, the first lecture where we talk about the meaning and use of these various terms. Okay, the Métis were in early and even recent Canadian history referred to by the derogatory term half-breeds. Again, we discussed this. Métis are people whose descendants are both Indian and French Canadian. Actually, you can um, it's, it's more broad than that. There were uh, English or Scotch uh, Métis as well. Métis ancestry goes back to the fur trade when Canadian fur traders had families with people of native, native heritage. Under the law, Métis were wholly neglected by the federal government. They're often referred to as the forgotten people or even the non-people. The, um, the federal government uh, 
um, denied any special responsibility towards them under Section 91 of the BNA. Métis were treated as ordinary citizens with no entitlements to the rights afforded to full Indians under the treaties. Métis, unlike Indian peoples, are given no land uh, reserves by the federal government, nor do they have any opportunity for self-government in their own territory, as do the Inuit and Nunavut. Uh, most of the Métis population is spread out and dispersed in Canada's urban centres. Again, kind of a review from our last uh, lecture, but good for you to recall. Because you'll have Métis people in your classrooms. Maybe you were Métis. Uh, where Indians in Canada were treated paternalistically, or like children who need special supervision, the Inuit or the native people in Canada's north were wholeheartedly neglected well until the 1950s. Uh, this neglect continued even after 1939, the Supreme Court decision that said that the Inuit ought to be protected in Section 91 of the BNA. Only since 1999... Have the Inuit people had an opportunity for self-government with the creation of Nunavut? So, these destructive assimilationist policies, remember on the one side of the arrow, the far, far one side. The official historical policy of the federal government was one of assimilation, of removing indigenous identities from Canada's native peoples and of transforming them into ordinary citizens. This policy often had very terrible consequences. The goal of common Canadianism was explicit and vigorously pursued for status Indians. Many of their cherished customs were banned, the potlatch on the west coast of, in 1884, and the sun dance on the prairies in 1895. Residential schools were designed as agents of assimilation to remove children from influence of their parents punish them for speaking English or Indian languages, introduce Christianity and inculcate negative attitudes to their own culture. So this is cultural genocide, right? These are the, this is the tool. Indian Act was this tool that they used to obliterate Indian identity within the native, uh, native population. The federal government, in fact, waged a cultural assault on Indian peoples. Today, the rights of Inuit, Indians, and Métis are all covered under the 1982 Constitution. These three groups are recognized and protected as Aboriginal peoples of Canada. So that's another term we looked at, meaning of Aboriginal people. Okay, so what are these two extreme polar opposite views on Aboriginal policy in Canada? Remember, these, these views um, have historically affected... Um, native people in the most drastic ways and they shape politics and political dialogue folks they shape what can be done in regards and what has been regard done in regards to native education um, you can see them panning out even today more on the parallelism side but you can even see how um, extreme parallelism has uh, stymied uh, really good uh, opportunity for education policy good education policy, ref re reformed uh, education policy. Okay, so political thought and policy on Native people in Canada always seems to tend toward two extremes. Historically, the Canadian government has adopted an as extreme assimilationist view of Aboriginals. According to this view, the point of Aboriginal policy is to assimilate Native people so that they're treated exactly the same as everyone else in Canadian society. This view would mean getting rid of any special rights that are afforded to Native people because of the treaties. The treaties uh, between Native people in Canada and early European settlers would essentially be ignored if assimilation were adopted. Okay, This view of Aboriginals is best illustrated in Trudeau's 1969 white paper. Although, by the way, they're the, white, the word white, um, it's kind of a weird double entendre. Uh, it doesn't mean like, yeah, white power. It, it doesn't mean that, even though it's it's kind of curious as a metaphor. But uh, white paper is just, it's a name for any paper that a government has where they put forth a kind of a proposal for a, you know, a bill uh, that might one day become law, right? It's a, it's a big idea paper is what it is. Anyway, after the defeat of the white paper, Aboriginal policy began to shift towards the opposite extreme view 
of the two row wampum theory. So, oh, what is wampum anyway? Sounds like a strange word. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. Well, wampum is a small and short tubular shell bead. Although individual beads have been found in archaeological record, it's believed the use of wampum in belts dates from the 15th century. The Iroquois originally obtained wampum of this form and color by trade and tribute from uh, the wampum makers of Long Island. <coughs> the Iroquois didn't make the beads themselves and wampum didn't serve as a form of currency among indigenous peoples. Wampum belts presented or received at councils recorded significant events in Iroquois history. Woven belts were recorded of, um, were records of important civil affairs. They were records of events, ideas, contracts, pledges, treaties, or compacts between political entities. When no need or when no longer needed as a record, belts were commonly unraveled and the beads reused. Okay, so this two-row wampum, what's that about? Well, early European settlers made an agreement of friendship with native people. Don't forget, when Europeans got here, there were millions of native people, all spread across the whole continent. Like, it was a, a whole world, right? And, um, you know, uh, Europeans were pretty outnumbered and outgunned. <laughs> and so, you know, they couldn't just come in there and conquer everybody they had to uh, they had to make friends um, and so this was one of the things that they did with the native people they established friendship treaties but because the native people uh, didn't have a formal writing system they used wampum to symbolize and record this treaty the native people called this a treaty belt the white wampum background symbolizes purity good minds and peace. The two purple wampum rows symbolize the two parallel paths of native people on the one hand and European colonists on the other. Moreover, the symbolism of parallel paths suggests that neither the native people nor the European colonials shall interfere with one another's way. The native people gave the Europeans the understanding that this agreement would last as long as the sun shines, the rivers flow, and the grass grows green at a certain time of the year. This agreement between them was meant to exist for generations to come, and everyone was supposed to remember it and never forget it. Pretty significant stuff. Anyway, the historical Turo wampum belt symbolizes the relationship between Europeans and native people. You know, so this, again, just to reiterate, one purple row of beads represents the path of native canoe, which contains their custom and laws, and the other represents the European vessel, the sailing ship, with its customs and laws. And the meaning of the parallel paths, parallel, right, is that neither boat should outpace the other, and paths should remain separate, and parallel forever, right, forever. They don't cross, they intersect, they don't intersect. That is as long as the grass grows and rivers flow and the sun shines. All right, well, soon after Henry Hudson's 1609 exploration of the Hudson River and its estuaries, uh, traders from the United Provinces of the Netherlands set up trading posts to engage in the fur trade. At the time of the, the Iroquois, Mohawk, and the Mohican territory abutted in the Mid-Hudson Valley. The Dutch traded with the indigenous population for fur pelts, particularly from beaver, which were abundant in the region. By 19, or 1614, the New Netherland Company was established and Fort Nassau was built, setting the stage for the development of the new colony, or for the colony of New Netherland, along the eastern seaboard of the United States. There's an old map of it there. And the wampum, well, the 1613 agreement was recorded by the Haudenosaunee. Uh, that's another name for the Iroquois. Um, in a wampum belt known as the two-row wampum. So that's what we were just talking about. Wampum records the meaning of the agreement, which declared peaceful coexistence between the Haudenosaunee and Dutch settlers in the area. And the pattern of the belt consists of two purple rows. Okay, so same kind of an idea here. So, 
out of that original historical Turo wampum, right, which was, you know, uh, this thing between the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee, and the, and the Dutch, or the Europeans, uh, comes this modern-day theory that, uh, saying that, well, this same situation has never, um, has never been dissolved, the other treaties, uh, they don't figure into it, the, uh, the, the temporal historical events don't figure into it. This Turo wampum theory still has as much um, power today as it did back when the vast majority, vast majority of people living in in uh, North America were uh, First Nations peoples. So, what is the Turo wampum theory? Well, the second extreme pole in Aboriginal policy is a reaction to the first. I mean, think, you know, think about how it is, right? If someone is endlessly, um, you know, violating you, abusing you, beating on you, not listening to you, just, you know, for hundreds of years, I mean, there's only so much you can take before you go as far away from them as you can. And I think that that is kind of what's happened um, in this second, um, or this this other extreme. So, the two-row wampum vision of two separate societies on separate paths heading to separate destinations today, right? Whereas the assimilationist perspective stresses the absolute similarity of Aboriginal peoples with the rest of Canadian society as its main objective, the two-row wampum uh, view stresses the absolute difference of Aboriginal people from the rest of Canadian society with the objective of separating the two societies culturally, socially, and politically. Instead of our Canadian federal system of two orders of government, the two, like, you know, the prov provincial level or the provincial order and the federal order, right? Or the national order. The two-row wampum theory suggests that Canadian federalism ought to be organized in the form of treaty federalism. Treaty federalism would envision Canada much more like a mini international system of little Aboriginal nations within Canada, treated on an equal basis with the rest of Canada. The rest of Canada would interact with these hundreds of small nations, well, over 600 actually, with her borders in a nation-to-nation -nation relation. This extreme view of Aboriginality weakens the notion of a common Canadian citizenship for all people. So, you know, when I'm trying to think about this, or when I first encountered this idea of treaty federalism and, um, you know, this extreme kind of uh, parallelist idea or ideology, I tried to understand it. How can I think of, oh, let me think about it as a cookie. <laughs> Big chocolate chip cookie. There's Canada. And um, Canada is got all these uh, reserves all scattered all through it all over the place and each one of those is a chocolate chip and each one of those is its own nation and each one of those is a nation unto itself uh, it's wholly sovereign unto itself uh, you know one nation isn't the same as another nation is the same as another nation each one of them have their own specific government and uh, you know Canada anytime you know Can Canadians the rest of Canada uh, wanted to do anything or to perform any function, they would need to enter into constant negotiation with um, these little uh, state states within states. You see how complicated that can get. In fact, um, maybe, I mean, I like the cookie image because I like cookies, <laughs> but uh, uh, maybe a better one in some ways is, is a Swiss cheese, right? Uh, what would Canada be? Uh, Canada would almost look like a Swiss cheese, right? It would have all these holes all over it. Um, it it's really doesn't seem to, I mean, it's a theory. It doesn't seem to have much um, workability in practice. It doesn't seem to be very viable, but it's very, very strong uh, and politically powerful um, in the minds of people who wish to change, you know, ch change everything radically. Okay, so, I mean, Ovid Mercredi, um a very, very famous uh, Canadian politician. He's Cree. Um, he was Assembly of First Nations uh, National Chief. 
him and also Mary Ellen Turpel, another um, uh, very famous uh, Cree Canadian, uh, one of um, uh, Time Magazine said she was one of the top 20 Canadian leaders for the 21st century. These two people, I mean, I, I think that uh, treaty federalism is kind of batty myself, but, you know, who am I? I'm just, this, I'm just who I am. These people really support uh, the two-row wampum theory of Canada. And they write, The First Nations view our relationship today as a continuation of the treaty relationship of mutuality, where neither side can act unilaterally without consultation. The partnership is symbolized by the grandfather of all treaties, the Iroquois Confederacy, the two-row wampum between your ancestors and those of the Iroquois. The two-row wampum committed us to a relationship of peaceful coexistence where the First Nations and Europeans would travel in parallel down the symbolic river in their own vessels, right? We just talked about this. The two-row wampum, which signifies one river, two vessels, committed the newcomers to travel in their vessels and not attempt to interfere with our voyage. Two vessels would travel down the river of life in parallel course and would never interfere with each other. It was a co-living agreement. Two-row wampum captures the original values that govern our relationship, equality, respect, dignity, sharing of the river we travel on. This is how the First Nations still understand our relationship with the Canadians. So, I mean, it, it's a very uh, idyllic uh, image. But, you know, one wonders how how practical, how reasonable um, that is, you know, at a time when, uh, well, Canada is a radically, radically different place. North America is a radically, radically different place. Um, you know, the situation is different. Um, you know, even Native Canadians are, 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 you know, I mean, people, cer certainly the Indian Act has assimilated uh, in the most violent way uh, Native people, but also, you know, um, Native people fall in love with non-Native people, and it's gentle, and it's good, and they, people marry, and they move away from reservations, and they, they, um, they assimilate on their own. And so it doesn't, it, it's, it's kind of a strange, you, you know, you wonder how such a vision, I mean, it's so black and white, you wonder uh, what, what practicality it has, if not just as a pipe dream. So Alan Cairns, he notes that it's odd, possibly even bizarre, that the nation-to-nation -nation label enjoys almost a complete conceptual hegemony at a time when the urban aboriginal population, for which nation-to-nation -nation has little meaning, is growing rapidly and already constitutes half of the aboriginal peoples in Canada. In his view, this extreme form of aboriginality does not accurately reflect the reality that most aboriginal people do not live on reservations, but have moved away to the big cities. So this cookie business, or the Swiss cheese, um, it's not it's not really a viable uh, uh, political option. But it's very potent. So what's the best way forward? Well, I mean, we can debate this as a class too, right? We can discuss it, but there's still no general agreement on what form Aboriginal policy should take in Canada. Assimilation is still a popular view among many, and it's looked at favorably as a cost-cutting measure in government. That's very true. Although the parallelism of the two-row wampum theory has a lot of support among many Native leaders and organizations. It too has problems. Right? Both, both of these... I mean, this is contested territory, folks. And, and there's supporters for both sides and detractors for both sides. I think both sides are not so good myself. But in particular, there are a large number of urban aboriginals or Native people who live away from the reservations in big Canadian cities. Parallelism won't work for them because they don't wish to live separately from the rest of Canadian society. Also, unless Native Canadians actually live on the reservations, there's very little opportunity for them to exercise any form of self-government. So, assimilation stresses similarity to the detriment of difference, see? And parallelism stresses difference to the detriment of similarity. 
So they're both extremes, right? Neither the assimilationist paradigm nor the parallelism paradigm is capable of handling difference and similarity simultaneously. A less extreme view lying somewhere in between these two poles is needed for good Aboriginal policy. That's my position. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I didn't invent that. <laughs> Honestly, uh, the most sensible uh, book that I've read on this subject is Alan Cairns' uh, Citizens Plus book. Um, and so most of the ideas I've, I've uh, uh, introduced you to here are directly from him. Okay, so what is treaty federalism? Well, treaty federalism is a kind of vision of Canada. Treaty federalists look at present-day Canada as an illegitimate form of federalism. They think that the country of Canada is founded upon native land and overlooks early agreements between Europeans and native peoples known as treaties. Treaty federalists believe that land has been that has been reserved for native people or won back in land claims agreements ought to be under the complete control of native people. The rest of Canadian society should have no say about what happens within native territory. Right? So it's sovereign territory, like a little chocolate chip in a vast cookie. <laughs> According to the theory of treaty federalism, Canada ought to be thought of as a country with hundreds of little Aboriginal nation states inside of it. Each of these states ought to be able to bargain with Canada on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. Right? So if you thought politics was hard enough in Canada, trying to get all the different provinces to agree on a thing or to move on anything or trying to get even within a province, people to agree on anything. Now imagine when you throw that into the in the ball a wax, right? In this way, Canada is viewed as less of a country and more like a mini international system in which the idea of common citizenship is extremely weakened. So treaty federalism bears some similarities with the compact theory of federalism that was popular at Canada's beginnings. Well, let's do a little bit of histor historical uh, recollection here about the compact theory. So, remember John A., father of uh, First Prime Minister, uh, against Macdonald's vision of a strong centralized government and weak provinces, many provincial leaders thought of Canada in the opposite way, as a country made up of strong provinces with only a very weak national government. See, just a slightly different uh, a slightly different angle on what Canada would be. This vision of Canada, like McDonald's, also conflicted with the true, federal, true federalist vision of Canada that's embedded in the division of powers. This view of the Canadian Federation is known as the Compact Theory. So the Compact Theory suggests that the provinces have sovereignty when it comes to changing the Constitution. The strongest formulation of this theory renders Ottawa irrelevant. More moderate formulations don't exclude the national government, but protect the provinces by giving them all a veto. Uh, the leader of the provincial rights movement was this man, Oliver Mowat. He was the Premier of Ontario at the time. Uh, here's what he had to say, um, or rather Donald Creighton has to say about Oliver Mowat. He says, He went back to the grit tradition, which was older than Confederation and older than the Coalition of 1864, to the upper Canadian tradition of sectional grievances, claims, and protests. And in the context of the Federal Union, this tradition acquired fresh vitality as the doctrine of provincial rights. Mowat's claim, or Mowat's, Mowat's aim now was to uh, elevate the political status of his province and to enlarge the sphere of its legislative and administrative powers. So he's really very much looking out for uh, Ontario or Upper Canada and, and just Upper Canada or Ontario at the time. In Mowat's view, an independent Canada must have strong provinces. Sovereignty must reside as much as possible with the provinces at the local level. So you can see, right? kind of an association between compact theory and treaty federalism. Well, they're similar, but they're also different, see? Because according to the compact theory, Canadian sovereignty 
truly resides with the provincial government and not with the national government. Canada as a country is only equal to the sum of its parts, which have created Canada on the basis of a common agreement or compact. However, treaty federalism is not like the compact theory, insofar as confederation was meant to create a new political nationality out of our disparate provinces. Treaty federalism rejects any notion of a common citizenship or a new political nationality in favor of the development of a preservation of Aboriginal First Nations as distinct from a Canadian nationality. See, so it's quite a bit more radical than the compact theory. You know, there's no common citizenship, really. It's no common political nationality, right? You've got two absolutely separate, parallel regimes with different identities that just cannot that are not mixing. So, you know, you can see how come it's it's parallelist, right? There's an old, um, one of the old medals that um, uh, was given out um, at each one of the signings of the numbered treaties. The treaty federalism view of Canada stresses direct Aboriginal representation. So, Non-native politicians and governmental structures are thought to be illegitimate means of representation. Like, no one can represent you if you're a native person except another native person, or actually you, directly. Uh, but, you know, if in your riding, uh, the person who um, uh, is the politician that's elected there happens to be Chinese or, you know, Chinese-Canadian or Indo-Canadian or, 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 or a white guy, uh, you know, they're, they can't because of the color of their skin. Nobody can represent you except somebody who is from your race with your blood. So it's a very different notion, right? It, it, it's un, it doesn't sit well, in my view, with, um, you know, our sense of Canadianness, where, uh, you know, we're not about blood and race um, that represent, you know, in, in my writing... You know, it could, you know, anybody from any part of the world could could represent, um, you know, me at a federal or provincial level, or for that matter, at a at a civic level. Treaty federalism suggests that native representatives in government deal with uh, the rest of Canada not as politicians representing a segment of the Canadian politician, but as diplomats dealing with a foreign country. Treaty Federalists think that Native people should not vote in Canadian or provincial elections. Voting is considered illegitimate because it is part of a white power structure, right? It's a foreign invasion. It's, it's not truly uh, Native. It's not truly Indian. Uh, it needs to be discarded. Um, and again, right, like, you've got this idea of identity politics that no one can really represent you within a system unless they themselves share your racial background or anything like that. Moreover, Aboriginal organizations representing the interests of Native people in our national and provincial governments, like the Assembly of First Nations, aren't acceptable either. Treaty Fed So, actually, there's even a move on right now among many Native organizations to say the AFN is, you know, as out, 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 you, out, outlived its usefulness. Um, Treaty Federalists believe that Native people need direct representation as nations instead. They would create a second federal order between Native people and the rest of Canada and they would dissociate Native people from Canadian citizenship as much as possible on the reservations. Urban Natives, Aboriginal people who have moved away from the reservation, would be entirely forgotten or dismissed as uh, sellouts uh, to the white establishment who have essentially accepted the logic of assimilation and rejected their own native heritage. Treaty federalism is based on a rigorous examination of the treaties and the way that the treaties have been neglected and abused over time. So, again, two extreme opposites, right? You've got this horrible horrible history of assimilation and you've got this extreme backlash and this parallelist ideology that's popped up.
Well, what is parallelism anyway? Parallelism is a particular view of the relationship between Aboriginal peoples and the rest of Canadian society. The idea is that the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples should form two completely distinct separate societies. It's the viewpoint espoused by Treaty Federalism, as well as by the two rule wampum theory of native-non-native relations. It's the extreme polar opposite view to the assimilationist perspective. And as you're thinking about this, folks, think about, you know, how do these different, um, how do these two extremes affect education? What, I mean, we know what assimilationist education looks like. It's the horrible, horrible residential schools and these sorts of things. But opposite to that, what would an assimil or sorry, a parallelist education system look like? All right. I think that's an excellent question. I don't know that many people have honestly asked that question who are, are, who are promoting it so um, passionately these days. Parallelism became the dominant policy ideal after the defeat of the white paper. There are serious problems with parallelism in the two-row wampum theory. It's, is it practical to reorganize Canada into a mini-international system in which the average population of the typical Aboriginal nation is 5,000 to 7,000 people, or as low as 2,000? These numbers are much smaller than even the provincial population of PEI. Also, if a form of parallelism is adopted, then what claim can Aboriginal people have to using Canadian government services like health care and education? How do um, Aboriginal citizens fit into federal and provincial communities and services. Moreover, what would happen to half of the Aboriginal population that lives off reserves in cities in a parallel system? How could urban Aboriginals be part of a separate system when they themselves have chosen to assimilate themselves into a larger Canadian society? So, the parallelism proposals of, like, we're going to look at it, Penner, and Charlottetown and the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. These things display little concern uh, should their uh, proposals be implemented for whether the nature of community in the country as a whole will induce us to feel responsible for each other. That's important in a country. Feeling responsible for one another, regardless of the color of our skin. Do you feel any sense of responsibility to your neighbor? to the person who lives next to you, the person who, you know, is in the city with you or lives in the country, right? The two-row wampum uh, theory or model so frequently proposed as the arrangement that will fit our needs stresses the permanence of difference. Parallelism has little to offer a growing urban Aboriginal population. Parallelism, the two-row wampum, does not address the reality of our interdependence and of our intermingling. Okay. Well, how would parallelism affect Canada? One, parallelism treats Canada like one nation and all the hundreds of Aboriginal tribes and bands as nations as well. Politics in Canada would then become a huge web of nation-to-nation -nation relationships regulated by treaties. Parallelism may reduce the ability of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians to treat each other as fellow citizens. I mean, it's bad enough with the racism, and the racism goes both ways, folks. Uh, not being able to see each other, just being able to see, only, be, only seeing, you know, caricatures of one another. Uh, that is ugly and unhealthy, and, 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 and it makes us all sick. And, um, you know, how is this going to make anything better when you don't feel any sense of community or commonality with your, you know, with people just because they're from a different tradition or heritage or ethnicity than you. Number two, the Assembly of First Nations argue that the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms shouldn't apply to self-governing Indian First Nations in a parallel system. In this way, Aboriginal people would be greatly distanced from an important symbol of Canadian citizenship. We talked about the ambivalence of the AFN towards the um, the Charter, and also the ambivalence of uh, n Native women's organizations towards the AFN. 
because they like the Charter because the Charter protects them as women from many of the, the paternalistic and patriarchal abuses that um, you know they're exposed to um, on the reserve uh, from their own Aboriginal communities. And number three, parallelism would bypass parliamentary theories of representation. It would grant Aboriginal people direct representation at First Minister's conferences. Parallel, number four, parallelism leads to separatism. And number five, the nation label that Aboriginal people use in reference to themselves as First Nations tends to crowd out all other civic identities. There's a false equivalence between Quebec's use of nation and the Aboriginal use of the term uh, because the Aboriginal population in Canada is less than a, a thousandth of Quebec population. So, anyway, that, that's just some of the uh, ways in which the more polarized, parallelist uh, idea uh, or policy um, would affect Canada. And so, what are the dangers of the native, non-native, or us versus them mentality. Recent debate about the place of Aboriginal peoples in uh, Canadian Confederation has become distorted by an us versus them or native, non-native mentality. Dividing Canadian citizens along racial lines like this can be very dangerous, since it can lead to heightened problems of racism. Not only is the us versus them mentality hurtful to our feelings of common citizenship, Again, like we need that in in order for Canada to be a place that's peaceful, where we care about each other and uh, we're willing to work together on things. We need that, but it's also based on the false idea that Aboriginal people can be wholly separate from non-Aboriginal society. In fact, there's a very high rate of intermarriage between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians. Here's some statistics: uh, thirty-four percent of status Indians marry non. Aboriginal people in Canada. For status Indians living off reservation, the figure is as high as 62%. On the reservation, it's still 25%. Approx approximately 50% of uh, status Indians married non status persons between 1965 and 1985. So there's a lot, right? A lot of cultural exchange between Aboriginal and non Aboriginal Canadians that makes the us versus them concept unrealistic. Aboriginal societies, like all other societies, therefore are penetrated societies. That's a good way of putting it. Their members live in many worlds at once and relate to more than one community. Alright, so that's a little introduction to um, the um, polarizing nature of Aboriginal policy. And all in the mix of that, of course, you've got you know, education, right? How is education affected um, in in this stream? Well, now I'd like to talk with you about the treaties uh, and the history of the treaties in Canada, just to give you a flavor of uh, of um, these documents. I mean, they are constitutional documents. We tend to um, <laughs> we tend to think that what's the Canadian Constitution? It's um, you know, it's just the BNA Act from 1867, and then the Charter. Uh, some of us also realize that it's, you know, um, par the parliamentary democratic form. That's the, con you know, um, part of our Constitution. And then, you know, some more of us understand that, um, you know, it includes whatever judges rule on constitutional matters. But, you know, we maybe we forget that the treaties are actually constitutional documents as well, right? And constitutional documents have a very special and sacred place in in, um, in law too, folks. Uh, there's no law that can stand in Canada if it violates the Constitution, okay? So, uh, you know, if someone makes a horrible, you know, if they make a law that says tomorrow, you know, um, oh, I don't know, like all black people have to go sit at the back of the bus, like, you know, back in the old days in the United States. Uh, that simply wouldn't fly in Canada because Section 15 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms talks about racial equality, right? And you can't, you can't discriminate against anybody on the basis of the color of their skin or anything like that. Well, 
you know, the treaties are constitutional documents just as important on equal footing with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, so they need to be upheld. But how are you going to uphold them if you don't know what they say, right? So we're going to go into that. The first of them actually goes back long before uh, Canada was a country. And this document actually um, is figured into a great number of uh, significant court cases uh, where Aboriginal people across Canada have, have won significant victories. Uh, you know, where, where um, in ordinary politics, everyday politics, they've been shunted out and had no success. Uh, they found great success in the courts uh, as their champions for, um, you know, different issues that are arising for them. And uh, the Royal Proclamation has come up uh, a number of times in these court cases. So what is it? Let's have a look here, if I can uh, bring the screen up. The 1763 Royal Proclamation created a huge native land reserve in the heart of North America. Don't forget, like 1763, that's right after the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, right? You know how significant the Battle of the Plains of Abraham was in Canadian history. So this is just, just after that. It protected uh, natives in all the land west of the Appalachians, and it kept all European settlement in the east. Okay, so it was meant to say, you guys stay over there, uh, Europeans stay east, and the west of it, that's native land, okay? According to this proclamation, natives weren't allowed um, to sell land privately to s individual settlers. All right. They could only sell to the governors of the colonies. By restricting the flow of settlement westward, the proclamation was meant to keep settlers dependent on Britain and the mercantile system of trade. Britain wanted to keep strong control over British North America and its, all its settlers, all their resources. Therefore, settlers had to be kept within the reach of the government. So stay over here where we can watch you. Uh, the farther west that settlement spread, the more unlikely it would be that Britain would be able to maintain control over her acquisitions. But the proclamation failed. Firstly, the American Revolution loosened Britain's stranglehold on power in North America. Secondly, Britain couldn't stem the tide of western settlement, and so lost, uh, lost control over the interior regions of the continent. Which was an ugly business, right? Because people started to push west and there was no law out there or anything and so they just went on these massive uh, murdering campaigns against native people and, and wiped them out as, as they moved across the American West. Um, here's a document summary for the Royal Proclamation. This proclamation outlined the future government of Quebec. The governor would call an assembly so soon as the state and circumstances of the said colonies admit. Governors had power to make laws for public peace, welfare, and good government, as near as, agree uh, as, near as may be agreeable to the laws of England. The document also reserved lands for Aboriginal peoples or Indians and ordered people who had settled on those lands to leave. All right. So additionally. Any future negotiation with Aboriginals was to be done in public with representatives from Britain and nobody else. Right? So they want it to be official uh, government business, not you know just people going and making deals, land deals on their own, and saying that you know uh, they entered into a private agreement. And then the final results of uh, such negotiations were to be recorded in written treaties, and Britain alone had the right to purchase Aboriginal hunting and fishing grounds, but gave Aboriginals the right to hunt and fish on these acquired lands. Okay, so a significant document. If you are interested in reading um, the Royal Proclamation, you can find copies of it online. It's, it's brief. Um, I'd like to move on and look at the uh, treaties in Canada now. That uh, picture um, on that slide there um, actually is of um, one of the treaty medals so um, if you go to um, southern Saskatchewan kind of on the Alberta border 
a very famous historical national historical site uh, down there is Fort Walsh. <laughs> Um, really interesting place to visit, folks. But uh, Fort Walsh is a significant place um, in uh, Canadian and Native history. Um, you can look up more information on it. But this this uh, is a treaty medal. It's a, a replica of one of the treaty medals. And uh, um, the historians down there, uh, when they're talking to you about the significance of Fort Walsh, um, also talk about the treaty medals and the treaty process and stuff. It's very interesting. So treaties in Canada, uh, the rights proclaimed, proclaimed for native peoples in the treaties are now protected in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, both sections 25 and 35, okay? We've discussed section 35 in the last lecture. We'll look at section 25 in a future lecture. Anything termed a treaty becomes a constitutional document. Treaties in Canada can be divided into three main groups. I've highlighted them in red for us. The first group are the pre-1763 Eastern Treaty, so even before uh, the Royal Proclamation. The pre-1763 documents illustrate unequal war adversaries. <laughs> Alright, so uh, here, these are the documents where, you know, uh, the native people were way more powerful than Europeans. Europeans were just a teeny tiny little group. Uh, they had guns and weaponry that the native people didn't have but there were you know the native native people lived everywhere everywhere all over north and south america right uh, wonderful um, diversity of peoples um, but it was definitely unequal war adversaries they're not written to resemble treaties and they're not land surrenders why would you surrender land to a bunch of europeans when there's just a teeny tiny amount of them right treaties at this time were more like surrender documents than agreements between nations and equal or equals. Most begin with the words articles of peace and submission. They were written as submission documents to stop the fighting between native people and the English. The pre-1763 Eastern Canada treaties also set up trade between the English and the native people. All right, so peace but also trade. These 18th century agreements were expressions of submissions to the crown. They were promises to keep the peace, and yet they also mentioned uh, some of the specific issues, such as the return of captives. Okay, so from 1492 to 1779, from first contact to uh, the peace and friendship treaties. Let's talk about that. Before the discovery of North America by European explorers, and I don't mean that um, you know, to say that they discovered, like, Aboriginal people lived everywhere, right? So Aboriginal people had an entire continent to themselves. They each had their own cultures and traditions, which ranged from nomadic lifestyles, such as the Plains people who followed the buffalo, to settled farmers such as the Iroquois. The arrival of the white man um, would eventually change everything and fundamentally affect the Aboriginal people's relation with the land and its resources. Aboriginal people, um, decision-making, Aboriginals did not have centralized formal governments in the European sense. Aboriginal societies were largely governed by unwritten customs and codes of conduct. These, or this poses problems for us today since it may be asked whether the treaties are really um, treaties. After all, treaties are commonly thought only to exist between states, but native people were not organized into states. Oral treating, treaty making. Oral treaty making also poses problems for us today, since treaties are conceived of as written documents, not oral agreements. However, Aboriginals claim to have had treaties with each other long before European fur traders or settlers arrived in what is now called Canada. Original or Aboriginal nations would use oral treaties to settle land disputes and end other conflicts including war. Trade and marriage arrangements were commonly made between tribes as well. When the Europeans arrived they brought with them their own methods, especially the written treaty. Particularly after the conquest, when 
the British gradually began to establish a strong hold on the continent, Aboriginals were not always happy with the outcomes of these written treaties. For governments of the time sometimes didn't include oral promises made to the Aboriginals in the written treaty. This forms the basis of many land claims today, as Aboriginal leaders demand to be given what they were promised, right? So, you know, the Europeans left things out that were said, and then they claimed that, you know, well, it wasn't written down, therefore it's not, it's not legit. And the Native people were saying, no, of course it's legit, because you agreed to it, and you promise is a promise, right? The covenant chain. Well, in the early 1600s, a series of treaties were negotiated between the 13 colonies, that's in the states, right? Which would eventually make up the United States, and the Six-Nation Iroquois Confederacy. These agreements likely originated between the Mohawk Nation and the colony of New York, and were represented by iron or silver chains that symbolized the binding of a promise. These agreements would often uh, be negotiated as more excuse me, as more financial aid to the Aboriginals was needed, and the chains would be symbolically polished to show that revisions had taken place. Other colonies, including Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maryland, and Rhode Island, would later join the chain, as would the Tuscarora tribe. The chain lasted until 1753, when the Mohawk broke it, upset that the Anglo-American settlers had begun occupying um, Confederacy lands without permission of any of the six nations in the chain. In 1754, an elaborate condolence ceremony was held in Albany, New York, which saw colonial leaders make peace with the Aboriginals by offering gifts, and the chain was then restored. And you've got the Great Peace of 1701, right? So this is from Montreal. One example of early treaty making between Europeans and Aboriginal pe peoples was the Great Peace of 1701. When 1,300 um, delegates of more than 40 First Nations converged on Montreal, the treaty that followed the negotiations ended almost 100 years of war between the Iroquois Confederacy and New France and its allies. The significance of the treaty lasts to this day, as it sets a set a precedent. Um, the use of negotiation to settle disputes between First Nations peoples and European colonial representatives in what is now Canada. It also set the foundation for the expansion of the empire of New France to the south and west and ensured the neutrality of the Iroquois Confederacy in case of war between the French and the English in North America. At the outbreak of the Seven Years' War between British and French forces in 1756, the Iroquois was neutral. Aboriginal European relations in the 1700s. So by 1701, Aboriginal and Europeans had about two centuries worth of contact. Hard to believe, but true enough. While there had been uh, wars between the Europeans and Aboriginals, the relationship between both parties had stabilized. Aboriginal skills and knowledge about the harsh landscape helped many Europeans survive cold Canadian winters. These Aboriginals provided access to land uh, and furs for trading, as well as food supplies from fishing and big game hunting. On the other hand, European goods and technologies found their way into Aboriginal culture. The natives now had blankets, iron kettles, uh, guns and gunpowder as new tools. Over a period of time, Aboriginal and European uh, slowly became more interdependent, right? After you've had your your bullets and your guns and things like this, I imagine it was it'd be pretty hard to go back to um, you know more traditional ways as a native person, right? And then don't forget, right? Um, if you become more efficient as a hunter uh, or a trapper, then the nation, you know. Um, across the forest on that way or down the plain this way, you're going to outcompete them. You're going to become more successful. So I think um, it's safe to say that, you know, this new trading relationship with white people and Europeans um, actually uh, 
um, you know, maybe it was good in some ways for Aboriginal people. It also created a fair bit of conflict between uh, the different tribes and um, would have put them at each other's throats a bit more, I would say. Over a period of time, the Aboriginals and Europeans slowly became more interdependent. Cultural and social aspects were borrowed from both cultures and incorporated into trading ceremonies. A new cultural group, the Métis, talked about them, came out of this interaction between European and Aboriginal civilizations. The early European explorers uh, and traders were virtually all men, and some of them decided to settle down and start new families in Canada. Many started families by marrying Aboriginal women. The ancestors of these children form the basis of Canada's Métis population. Okay, the Peace and Friendship Treaties, there's a map for you. See where they're located off on the east coast there. Other colonial governments in the uh, area now covered by New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and the northern eastern United States began to sign peace agreements with the Aboriginals in the early 1700s, starting with the first peace uh, and Friendship Treaty in 1725, lasting until 1779. These treaties were designed to stop and prevent wars with Aboriginal people so that European settlers could begin to live safely on the land and use its natural resources. And there's the Ontario Treaties there in green, see? Uh, the Upper Canada Treaties from 1764 to 1836. The Ontario Treaties uh, this is this is the next section. We had the pre-1763 treaties. Now we're looking at the next significant out of the three groups, the Ontario treaties. Okay, the Ontario treaties concerned real estate and setting things up for settlement. These agreements were influenced by two factors: the Royal Proclamation of 1763 that recognized that Native people have property rights and the urgent need to settle the United States Empire, or sorry, United States, United Empire Loyalist refugees from the American Revolution, including native allies of the British, who started to stream north in the late 1770s. Agreements on the surrender of land after the War of 1812 were also very important in order to accommodate the northern immigration. The Ontario agreements were essentially real estate conveyances, though the later ones included a few elements that established an ongoing relationship. So in the years immediately following the Royal Proclamation of 1763, numerous treaties were signed with Aboriginals to settle small parcels of land in the province of Quebec, later Lower Canada, in exchange for a large sum of money, um, gifts, and the creation of smaller reserve land specifically for Aboriginals. Annual cash payments to the Aboriginal um, Aboriginals usually followed for some time after these deals were made. Many of these treaties were signed so the British could take land for settlements, roads, churches to help Christianize the Aboriginals and other uses. In one particular abuse, blank treaties, where the Aboriginal chiefs just signed uh, their tribe's land rights away on blank documents were often the order of the day. All right, So there was some dirty dealings against native people um, in the Ontario treaties. Many of these treaties were hastily and carelessly put together, particularly during the 1780s and early 1790s, when the British were faced with an influx of loyalist settlers emigrating from the newly created United States to the northern shores of Lake Erie. Lake Ontario. John Graves Simcoe, Upper Canada's first lieutenant governor, was responsible for purchasing and assigning this land. <laughs> so we honor him by having Lake Simcoe, and I grew up near Simcoe, Ontario, but he's a bit of a shyster. British uh, representatives often made hasty oral promises to Aboriginals that were never written down, simply to rush things along in obtaining land for farming and settlement. Because the Aboriginals valued their oral tradition of written legal documents, they would later complain that the British made promises that were not kept. While efforts were made after 1794 to ensure the treaty process was done with more fairness to the Aboriginals' 
Living in this region, outstanding land claims remained, particularly in regards to the blanket treaties. Or rather, the blank treaties, not the blanket treaties. My apologies. All right, so um, we've got pre-Confederation Ontario treaties here from 1811 to 1867. From 1781 to the War of 1812, the Crown entered into dozens of land transactions in southern Ontario. All of these agreements were simple arrangements. The Crown made a single one-time payment in goods for a specific portion of territory. There were no subsequent annual payments or any other continuing benefits. The agreements did not mention land reserves because at this stage land was plentiful and natives who sold a tract could move elsewhere. This was a turbulent period with far-ranging effects for Aboriginal peoples. First, the War of 1812 splintered the First Nations in Upper Canada and then uh, the U.S. Then Aboriginals gave up their land rights in the Northwest without involving the Métis who also lived on this land. Later, during the 1830s, Upper Canada started to rethink the necessity of giving presents to the Aboriginals as promised in the Niagara Treaty. Sir Francis Bond Head, the province's lieutenant governor, attempted to remove Aboriginals from their land and settle them on a new reserve in Manitoulin Island on Lake Huron. Um, what is this Treaty of Niagara that we just mentioned? Well, the, uh, the 1764 Treaty of Niagara was signed by Sir William Johnson for the Crown and 24 First Nations. Uh, the treaty transferred possession of a narrow four-mile strip of land along the Niagara River's western shore. This treaty also detached some of them from Pontiac's Rebellion. The Royal Proclamation of 1763 established the British definition of Indian country. On these lands, the Crown claimed sovereignty, but it also decreed that Indian land was to be considered the possession of the Aboriginal peoples who lived on these lands. Consequently, in order to transfer ownership of the land to the Crown through the surrendering of the land from the Aboriginal peoples, Great Britain began formalizing the Treaty of Fort Niagara with the First Nations through this Treaty Council. In protest, the Ottawa of Detroit, the um, Wyandotte of Sandusky, and the Lenape and Shawnee of the Ohio didn't come to the Treaty Council. This treaty created a new covenant chain between Britain and the First Nations of the Western Great Lakes. During the War of 1812, nations involved with this treaty allied themselves with the British, as the nations believed that the treaty bound them to the British cause. And then, of course, this big thing um, in Canadian history, the War of 1812. Many Aboriginals sided with the British during the War of 1812, partially out of a sense of obligation through the Niagara Treaty, but also because they thought the British would allow them to preserve enough land for their way of life. The British had appeared to support the creation of a buffer state between settlers and the Aboriginals in the past, particularly prior to the Jay Treaty. Some Aboriginals had their reservations with signing uh, with the British. However, the Americans were moving deeper into Indian territory and they appeared to be willing to wipe out the Ab Aboriginals by any means possible. So Aboriginal nations played a vital role in British victories during the war, including the taking of Detroit although it came at a considerable cost. In 1813, a popular leader, Tecumseh, was killed in the Battle of Thames. Or Thames. Um, this loss seriously uh, damaged Aboriginal unity and confidence, causing much of the political clout in Upper Canada uh, and the U.S. to vanish. Following the War of 1812, the Americans would largely remove any Aboriginals living east of the Mississippi River and forced them into Indian land, now known as Oklahoma. Many Aboriginals chose to migrate north 
into land around the Great Lakes in Upper Canada instead. Moving along then, another one of these Ontario treaties we've got is the Selkirk Treaty. In 1811, British aristocrat Thomas Selkirk wished to create a new colony in a region owned by the Hudson's Bay Company. Selkirk purchased land mostly located in what is now Lower Manitoba from the uh, Fur Trading Company. This, la this led to the creation of the Red River Settlement in 1812. The settlement only lasted for three years. Métis, who had called the area home, were angered that they had not been consulted, which partially led to much conflict um, in the region. In June 1816, the Métis killed um, the governor-in-chief of Rupert's Land and 20 of his men in the Seven Oaks incident. Two months later, Selkirk and a mercenary force attacked and captured Fort William from the Métis. In 1817, Selkirk decided to sign a treaty with uh, Cree and Chippewa nations, among others, to extinguish their claims to a tract of land on his domain stretching along the Red River. He distributed uh, this land to new settlers. When he died in 1820, the executors of his estate sought to control spiraling costs by ending new European settlement on the land. Only those who had settled during the late 1810s, plus some retired Métis fur traders, remained on the land. In 1836, land covered by this treaty reverted back to Hudson's Bay Company. This land changed hands once again in 1869 and became the property of the new Dominion of Canada. And this angered many Métis and Aboriginals, who felt that the new European settlers coming into the region were violating their land rights and disrupting their way of life. This was a leading cause of the Red River Rebellion in 1870. So there's lots and lots of history here, folks. Um, what do we got here? Returning to this Niagara Treaty that we talked about, um, here it is being rescinded in 1836. By the 1830s, the British government began to reconsider its promises to give annual presents to the Aboriginal nations that had signed the Niagara Treaty. At this point, European settlers in North America far outnumbered Aboriginal people. See, the, the, the tides had turned in the opposite direction now, folks, with regard to settlement and populations. And the United States and British colonies in North America were relatively stable and at peace. So very different situations. The government hoped to save money needed to assist European settlers coming to North America by cutting back on these presents. So they're going back on their word, see, uh, to Native people. Because they can. In 1836, Sir Francis Bond Head, the Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada, issued a statement at the annual present-giving ceremony on Manitoulin Island where the original Niagara Treaty wampum belts now reside, he announced that the number of presents given would be reduced. First to be eliminated were gifts to half-breeds, like that's the Métis, followed by those two non-British Aboriginals who had lived in the United States for two years or more. Eventually only the most deserving Aboriginals would receive these presents. So you can see um, how... Francis Bond Head was, you know, I mean, we use that horrible word, Indian giver. Uh, it's a racist term, right? But, you know, it's it's such a strange term because, um, you know, this suggestion is somehow, what, that Native people, uh, you know, gave things and now they want them back and they're, they're, they can't be trusted. Well, actually, isn't it the other, isn't it the other way around, right? Um, anyway... That's uh, Sir Francis Bonhead and his Bonhead Treaties here in 1836. By 1836, he believed that attempts to remake Aboriginal peoples living in his province to, in, into independent pioneer farmers were fought, failing. He felt the Aboriginals were hunters and gatherers by tradition, unused to working and living in an agricultural society. He also felt that the increase in European settlers had created problems for Aboriginal peoples. 
not least of which was alcohol. Well, Bonhead wanted to separate the Aboriginals in the province from the white population and move them to Manitoulin Island. So, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Manitoulin Island. It's, it's really beautiful, but it, it sure isn't that hospitable for farming. Uh, I don't know. So he wanted to move them to their smaller uh, nearby island in Lake Huron so they could pursue their regular lifestyle of hunting and fishing. Ultimately, Bonhead failed to convince most Aboriginals to move to the much, much less arable Manitoulin Island. Instead, they, what they really wanted was crown protection from white settlers on their ancestral lands. So while the colonial office more or less approved Bonhead's policy, it never revoked the Bonhead Treaties, it also met with substantial resistance in Britain, particularly from Aboriginal Protection Society, a, pro a Protestant group with links to the anti-slavery movement. You know, not everybody thought that the way uh, the Native people were being treated um, and just run off their land and being screwed out of their treaties and, and you know, just time and time again. Not everybody thought that was cool back then who, you know, was back in England or happened to be European. Uh, many people um, felt otherwise. Okay, um, Province of Canada Treaties from 1850 to 1862. See, they've highlighted here the Robinson, uh, Robinson Treaties. The discovery of um, minerals on the shores of Lake Huron and Lake Superior led the government of the province of Canada to take measures to extinguish Aboriginal titles to the land in 1850. Two treaties known as the Robinson Treaties were signed in 1850 between the Crown and Aboriginals. The latter gave up mining lands, including land directly below the Earth's surface, <laughs> in exchange for money and the creation of reserves. They were also given right to hunt and fish on these ceded lands. And then in 1862, the Manitoulin Island Treaty was negotiated, allowing European settlement on this land in Lake Huron. Okay, so that is the pre-1763 treaties, the Ontario treaties, and the third and final group here are the numbered treaties. Okay, uh, there were 11 numbered treaties between 1871 and 1921. Treaties 1 and 2 successfully assembled all the tribes in the area. However, later treaties covered larger areas of land, which means that it would be a lot harder to get all the tribes to assemble and some would be left out. Like, the most classic example I can think of is the Lubicon in northern Alberta. Uh, you can look up all kinds of information about the Lubicon, but it's very interesting. Like, when they called... Um, all the tribes together, they, they missed the Lubicon. Lubicon never found out. They never came down here to uh, near Alberta, or sorry, near um, in southern Alberta uh, at, at Crowfoot, uh, at Blackfoot Crossing. And um, because they weren't there and they didn't sign, where they live, um, you know, it's never been seeded. And it just so happens that there's oil and all kinds of you know, wealth up there, and, you know, it, it, what, I guess the Alberta government thinks, well, that's crown land. Well, no, it's not, because you never talk to the Lubicon, and they, that's their ancestral land, right? So, for a long time now, um, these um, issues have been going back and forth in Alberta history. Well, the numbered treaties focus on the surrender of Aboriginal title to land, and they, impose, they imposed even more continuing obligations and the later Ontario agreements. The number of treaties share some common characteristics. This is what they do. They all recognize Canadian sovereignty. They detail the explicit surrender of land title. Natives are allowed to continue hunting on surrendered land. Land reserves are set aside for benefit of Native peoples. Cash bonuses are promised to every Native person plus annual payments thereafter. Native peoples are guaranteed an education as well as access to social assistance. And all the treaties include a promise by all natives to obey the laws. All right, I want to look finally here at the numbered treaties with you. Um, you know, um, one of the places I really like here near Calgary, 
if you go east from Calgary and you go out past Strathmore and you go out past Gleeshan, just past there is the Siksika uh, Reserve and uh, you head south on the highway there down to Blackfoot Crossing and you know this is the place where um, um, the tribes all met uh, for Treaty 7 and um, one of the great chiefs um, in the area was uh, his chief uh, Crowfoot. Here he is with his family, and um, that's his grave there. Um, you can actually go. It's just it's just next to the uh, the great. It's a it's a beautiful spot where all the they all gathered in this um, um, great big valley, a river valley along uh, uh, along the bow there, and um, um, his grave is is up. Um, on the northern, on the northern side of, um, as you as you travel north along the road, but um, it's a it's a peaceful, it's a peaceful place, but things you know um, ended badly for all these children around Crowfoot. They all died in this picture. They all died of TB uh, within two years of that picture. And Crowfoot's grave, um, I mean, there's many graves out there. It's a silent place, but it's also a sad uh, place um, in that graveyard. I've been there many times to visit it. A great, great Canadian and a real lover of peace, a, a genuine peacemaker. There's an old picture um, of Blackfoot Crossing, the Treaty Flats, and there's a more modern one. You can see it's not it's not taken at the best time. It's uh, more beautiful in the in the summer and in the fall. And there. Um, Below that, you can see a picture of uh, the uh, Blackfoot Crossing um, Interpretive Center. Um, it's 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 really great if you want to learn about the treaties. They have a library in there. They have wonderful displays. They have knowledgeable uh, staff to lead you through. If ever you're if you're in the area and you want to take your kids in your in your school on a on a great uh, trip. That's a really excellent uh, destination point. It's not too far from Calgary. In behind it, there's wonderful walking paths. There's a, a valley down below. Uh, when I've been there, they've had teepees set up down there. All kinds of really good opportunities. Okay, uh, the first five numbered treaties covered areas in what was then part of the new province of Manitoba and the Northwest Territories, now parts of northwestern Ontario and southern Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta. The purpose of these treaties was to secure land from the Aboriginals for settlement and agricultural and industrial development. In the wording of these treaty documents, the Aboriginals were to give up their rights to the land forever. Notably, the government provided farm supplies and new clothes to help transform Aboriginal societies from nation, nations hunters, nation of hunters and gatherers into civilized farmers, like their European counterparts. In return for giving up their land rights, the Aboriginals received uh, reserve lands to live on, usually just 600 square meters, um, were provided to each family to live. Um, however, in treaties. Three and four only, the Aboriginals were able to successfully negotiate 2.5 square kilometers um, for each family. Cash, the amount of which differed between each treaty, however, the amount usually grew with each subsequent treaty. An allowance for blankets and hunting, farm assistance, school on reserve land. Uh, wherever desired, a census to keep track of how many people live there uh, for compensation purposes, the right to hunt and fish, uh, the right uh, for the government to build public buildings, roads, other crucial pieces of infrastructure. So in, re in, in return for the aforementioned idol items, Aboriginals had to promise they'd keep the peace and not possess any uh, liquor on their reserves. That's an interesting one because um, was it the court RV dry bones or something like that? Um, anyway, years later, that particular item uh, was challenged um, and successfully struck down. It seemed to be quite uh, discriminatory towards native people. Um, 
but anyway, at the time, that's one of the items um, that was um, demanded that Native people never um, consume alcohol. And again, right, some of the Aboriginal nations wouldn't sign these treaties at first, but wish to be added at a later date, and this is called adhesion when this happens. Okay, then Treaty 6, 1876. At first glance, Treaty Number 6, signed by the Plains and Woodland Cree Aboriginals, uh, is very similar to the first five. This time, however, the government faced more resistance as the Aboriginals had some very serious concerns. More European settlers were moving onto the prairies at an alarming rate, and as they moved westward, they displaced Aboriginals from their land. The buffalo had virtually disappeared from this region as well, and other big game animals like deer were not as plentiful. Therefore, more and more Aboriginals were now facing starvation. Diseases like smallpox were effectively wiping out Aboriginal nations. Poundmaker, famous Cree chief, refused to sign the treaty. He felt that the government was trying to grab land from his nation unfairly. However, by December 1882, he'd be forced to sign the treaty because the buffalo had disappeared to the point where the Aboriginals in his nation would otherwise face starvation. By then he felt it was in the Cree's best interest at, you know, to at least take as much money and resources from the government as possible. Additionally, uh, Treaty Number 6 is unique because it's the only treaty of its sort with a provision for health care. Um, one clause allows a medicine chest to be kept in the home of an Indian agent for the use and benefit of the Aboriginals. Some Aboriginals have felt this provision extends to everyone who signed the numbered treaties. Others even went so far to later interpret this provision as an eternal promise by the federal government to provide free health care. Okay, so interesting extrapolation. Treaty number seven, this is the one I was telling you about. Um, you can visit um, down at Blackfoot Crossing to learn all about it. This treaty was signed by a number of Aboriginal bands, including the Blackfoot and Stony Indians, among others in present-day southern Alberta. It's very similar to the ones that preceded it, with just a few notable exceptions. Uh, namely, there was no health care provision, and these bands were more successful in negotiating for more money and supplies than the previous Aboriginal negotiators. This would be the last numbered treaty signed between the government and the Aboriginals until 1899. Some members of these tribes expressed concerns about the perpetual nature of these treaties, and virtually all remained suspicious of the government track record. For instance, Northern Aboriginals looked uh, closely to the attempt, at attempts to turn the Prairie Aboriginals into farmers, something that had by 1899 shown signs of outright failure. Many Aboriginals on prairie uh, reserves were suffering from poverty and starvation. Thus, there was now a growing belief that the Aboriginals would eventually curtail Aboriginal, or sorry, that the government would eventually curtail Aboriginal fishing and hunting rights, since the land allowed for these activities shrunk considerably in these past in in these latter numbered treaties. The government refuted this during all numbered treaty negotiations and to um, allay this fear provided more cash for fish net twine and gun ammunition. Also previous treaties had called for government uh, to take a census of all Aboriginals living on land reserves for the purposes of paying them a lump sum every year. However the government had by this point lost count of many Aboriginals living on reserves. Even today we don't know how uh, precisely how many Aboriginals are in Canada because of the poor census taking in the late 1800s. All these things would weigh heavily on the minds of Aboriginals who agreed to sign treaties 8 to 11. Oh well, la last little bit here. Treaties 8 to 11 from 1899 to 1921. They were signed over a period of two decades. The terms and conditions are very similar to the first seven except there was no health care provision as there was in Treaty 6. Treaty 8 was signed in 1899 so the federal government could obtain Aboriginal lands uh, to the north of Treaty 6 found in present-day northern BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, 
in South, Central, and Northwest Territories. Treaty 9 was signed in 1905 and 1906 and dealt with lands in Northern Ontario. Treaty 10 was signed in 1906 and saw land cession deals struck in Northern Alberta. Treaty 11 was signed in 1921 and dealt with land and territories in the Northwest Territory in the Yukon. These treaties are all very similar in most of the number of treaties that preceded them. Uh, however, one concept new to Treaty 8 was the creation of small family reserves for individual families. This uh, was to meet the needs of small band groups like the Woodland Cree and Dene tribes that lived in the area. Despite the fact that northern aboriginals were not faring well, the government learned in 1898 that some bands were not interested in signing Treaty No. 8. These bands didn't want to live on reserves like their southern counterparts and they feared signing the treaty would virtually destroy their way of life. So there's a, a valuable map for you, um, you know, that you can inspect. Uh, it shows some of the treaties, um, you know. And this one I like too. Um, I took this from a really good textbook that you can still find in some schools um, by price. It's called Legacy Indian Treaty Relationships. You can see how um, some of the treaties there uh, we haven't really talked about are included. Okay, so um, that's, um, that's the subjects for today. Um, I hope that uh, you found that r relatively informative. You know, that um, um, thinking about the treaties has become um, um, part of your thoughts, your larger thoughts on um, Native rights. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you can see something about how these different um, uh, treaties figure into the way that we think about education, um, you know, um, you know, maybe greater education about treaties uh, would build more uh, intercultural understandings between natives and non-natives, uh, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal people. Um, these, these elements are important anyway. So thanks for your uh, attention, and we'll see you next time.